Good morning, everybody. Thanks for uh, coming to this inaugural conference. I think I, I think it's already it's already fun. It's a it's a nice size where people are just kind of talking to each other and having great conversations. There's a lot. I I've already seen that there's a lot of besides the people that are speaking. There's a lot of great technical experts in the audience, and so I think that our networking functions and all that will be really terrific. Not to mention the fact um, this is like. I've spoken at a lot of conferences. This is about the most distracting view I've had while trying to while trying to give a talk. Usually, I'm in you know we're in some dark, cold, sterile con conference room. Well, that's I just defined Vegas, didn't I? Um, so anyway, this this uh, this uh, talk is about uh, protecting corporate data in the wild. Darren was. So one of the things that they taught us at Intel was to always lock your PC when you're walking away. And of course, I was distracted and didn't. And my purportedly good friend, Darren here, uh, put wild thing on, the, on, the, on the, the title. So who is this guy? Um, I'm a senior architect for Agile. Uh, we are an identity and access management consulting company. We, we do Microsoft technologies. Uh, general identity and access management, and governance and risk compliance strategies for Fortune 500 companies. Um, I've been an MVP for a long time, 14 years, in what used to be called directory services and is now enterprise mobility. Uh, I spent 10 years at Intel. Uh, I was one of the architects of Intel's Active Directory and then spent the rest of my tenure uh, on the directory services team, eventually leaving it before I left. 15 years at Texas Instruments, where I did help roll out NT35 and 351 around the world. So yes, I'm old, almost as old as Darren. Um, I'd had a great, all that time, I have been writing about Windows Server and identity and all that. Uh, and for four years after my Intel uh, stint, I wrote, I was a full-time technology journalist as technical director for Windows IT Pro which was a blast. Uh, you get to go to conferences and interview interesting people and, uh, and then go off and write about it. So there's, I've got a bunch of articles out there. I think a lot of them are dated now just because I mean, they're about, about cloud identity. Cloud identity has evolved so quickly. Um, but, and I am proud to say that I am an alumnus of the DEC Wookley Pro-Am Challenge. Um, Bill did not go into this, I won't go into this in great detail. Uh, but it was a challenge that the former uh, uh, product manager lead for directory services for Active Directory would give to the participants of the conference at the beginning, at the, at the opening keynote. And by the time the conference was ended at the closing keynote, you would have to present the answer to the challenge. So one of the more famous ones was from uh, my friend Pamela Dingle that ended up at the closing keynote uh, representing Active Directory replication as an interpretive dance. Uh, we did uh, Active, Active Directory Disaster Recovery Haiku, which I have video of. And uh, perhaps the most famous were the top 10 requested features for Active Directory sung to the tune of an Elvis song. And we have video of that, and a number of the people at this conference, though they may not admit it, admit it participated in it. So I can prove it. That was Photoshop. That wasn't <laughs> And there is a certain other... German in here nearby that also participated in it, though he might deny it. So uh, the general areas that I want to talk about are protecting data versus protecting containers, uh, protecting data in the mobile environment, protecting data at the data level with Azure identi information protection. That's a common challenge. And finally, uh, AIP uh, deployment best practices. So this is about how do you protect the data in, in, in various environments? So data versus containers. We have a tendency after many, many years of working in this business to think that it's the containers that we care about. We're always doing things like um, putting layers of protection, whether it's physical protection like concrete at a data center, big heavy doors with sliding badges, um, network control to provide the boundaries that you care about and to keep bad guys from coming in, and all the way down to permissions, access control lists, and access control entries to the data. But 
while we've been fixated on the containers, really the principle that we're trying to do is to protect the data itself. So I encourage you to, when you're going forward, to make sure that you think about not so much the, the containers, but the data itself. Uh, I stole this, I, I, I repurposed this slide from Microsoft because I think it represents uh, a really good concept. So data lives in three major areas. First, obviously, is on-premises. And when you're on-premises, that kind of falls into two different uh, types of uh, data structures. The first is um, the structured data in a database, a SQL Server database, or uh, some kind of a line of business database. And the other is unstructured. It's gone out of that database for whatever reason, or it's been created out of thin air, and it resides in Word documents, Excel, you know, all that sort of stuff. And it's, and it's free floating around on file servers, on desktops, you know, it's a free for all compared to structured data. <clears throat> the next layer out is um, the mobile environment. Now, the mobile environment, it could be within the network perimeter, but most of the time, it's outside of the network perimeter because people working on mobile devices, except for the, the, the ones that are corporate and locked down, are generally connected to the wireless, to the public network. Even if you're in a, a corporate environment, you're connected to the public network. And it's very easy to get your data to that. And then the outer layer, which is the layer that people have the least control over and there is the least... Um, the, one of the greatest levels of concern today is in the wild. Once it gets from this protected environment or to this in, any kind of an environment like that and it leaves the corporation, it goes to somebody's Gmail, it goes to your home PC, it could be anywhere, and not only do you not have control of it, you don't even know that it's gone. I'm not gonna spend much time talking about um, protecting data on-premises in you know, the PC type environment because I really wanted to focus on um, a couple areas that have been uh, shown, we've seen to become, starting to become very popular and maybe are not quite as well comprehended. So in the mobile environment, the first thing that you have obviously is a device with no policies. And I like these graphics because they do a good explanation of how things can be segregated. So if I zoom in here and I look at this, in, in this environment, you know, we have, you could, put, you could have corporate data on an unstructured device, you could have your personal data on an unstructured device, you have applications that are accessing the uh, both corporate and personal willy-nilly back and forth and this is kind of like a zoom in of that. And the idea is, you know, you're working with Word and you can intermix corporate and personal data. There is no distinction between the two. There's no security required on it. This is, this is the default configuration that has people uh, very, very concerned. And a lot of the reason a lot of Office 365 deployments have gotten to a certain point and they've stopped is because they don't have any controls and they're not sure what controls to put on it. And they can see how easily their data can fly away uh, and they'll never find it again. This is quite well known. This is mobile device management. How many of you have got some kind of a mobile device management technology applied to your mobile, to your, your devices? So good, you know, half, half of the people out here have got some kind of an MDM technology. So in MDM, you lock up the entire device, all the way down to the hardware. You have control of the hardware, you can make control over everything. You can put a, you can put a uh, pin on the device, you can dictate all sorts of policies to the, the device, so that makes it, you know, that makes the de device very secure. Within the device, there is still no separation between corporate and personal information. So this is a device, this works well for you go to an AT&T store and you walk up and they say, hey, can I take your name in line? You know, they've got an iPad and it's a dedicated device. There's no personal information on it. It works great for that. If you go to a hospital and they check you in and the, the lady's got a pad and they do it, that's great. Uh, it works well for that. What it really is miserable at is bring your own device, BYOD. 
we've worked with a number of companies that have told us, well, we tried to do a BYOD program, but for some reason users just chose not to register their devices with our company and have us take control of everything they have. The device that they're still paying for, will I'll gladly cede control to you for the privilege of working for you after hours and checking emails after I'm you know, from work. So, no, it uh, is not very well adopted. But when you, put the contain when you put the container at the application level, you move it up from the device level to the application level, that makes a difference. So in that scenario, does this work? No, that doesn't work with ZoomIn. Let's try that again. So in that scenario, what is locked down in a container is just the corporate data. And the applications, and as you see, these are office mobile applications, can access either corporate data or personal data, but there is a barrier between the two. So this nice little lock key, obviously this is the locked corporate data and this is the personal data. So when you create a document um, in Word Mobile, and I wave my hands here because I was going to demo it, but the little demo software doesn't seem to be working on this wireless network. They can't find each other, so I'm just going to have to wave my hands. When you create a document in, say, Word Mobile, and you first add information to it, the app has no idea whether it's personal or corporate. Um, it's when you save it to either the corporate store or the personal store that that, um, that that distinction is made and then the policies are applied to it and the control is put to it. The beauty of this environment is that the user can have their own personal device. They can have all their apps on it. Their apps are untouched by the corporate control of this mobile application management. You can uh, even, you know, for the example of... Um, for the example of Outlook, you can, have, uh, you can have your corporate data be wiped on there and still have your personal data and email work just fine. Now, one of the drawbacks of, of it not having device control is that you cannot, you're not, you cannot tell the device that it must have a pin. But because it's application level, you can tell the application that it must have a pin. So in that example that I was describing where you create a document with uh, Word Mobile, and it didn't, require, it didn't require a pin to launch Word Mobile. Everything was fine. But if you choose to save it to OneDrive for business, as soon as you, choose, as you hit save, you are prompted for a pin, or alternatively, you, you can re-authenticate before, before you can save it to OneDrive for business. And once it's there, now it's under protection, and you can't save that document to local storage. And I'm going to show an example of what this policy looks like. So what applications support this, this mobile, support mobile access policies? You can see the laundry list here. Um, it's all of the ones that you would expect. And the list does admittedly keep growing. I mean, you've got the, the big apps. You've got PowerPoint. You've got um, Word, Outlook, um, Excel, OneNote. There's some new ones on here too, such as uh, Microsoft Teams. Does, has anyone played with Teams very much yet? We're starting to use Teams more and more often. Um, a lot of people like it. I'm still kind of, it's kind of a skin on SharePoint uh, right now, but it seems, to have some, it seems to have some advantages. So anyway, you can see there's a long list of applications that you can apply this to, and I'm gonna show what this looks like in the, in the policies in a minute. Um, if you have a line of business app that you want to be able to apply these policies to, to uh, Microsoft has what they call an app wrapping tool that will take the app and encapsulate it uh, so that the policies can be applied to it. It may not have um, the, the dual headedness, the multiple identities that you can do with the Office documents. Um, and if you have a completely custom app, you can use the Intune SDK to Build, this, build these characteristics right into the application and give you uh, the power that the, uh, that the, of the full uh, mobile application management. Yep? Quick question. Um, I've seen other container solutions, and it sounds like this is similar. Where you, if it's like a third-party app, you're sort of reliant on the third-party vendor to do the wrapping. In other words, you don't have, you 
can't, if you want an app wrapped for corporate use, like Slack, for example, you talked about Teams, you have to rely on Slack to do it. Is that the case with the Microsoft solution as well? Yes, so the question is, less Debbie beat me up, uh, is to repeat the question, and is that if you have a third-party application that you want to be able to take advantage of mobile application management for, the yes, you have to, um, be, because you have to be able to disassemble it to a certain amount to be able to do that. How mobile application management works, it's, this is one of the beauties of it. It's really quite easy to do. Um, from, an, from an administrative point of view, what you do is you set the Azure app, they're called application or app protection policies. <clears throat> and there are really three areas that you care about in the, the app protection policy. There is the, well, the general doesn't really count. General is just the naming of it. There is the assignments, which targets the policy scope. What users are, or devices will it apply to? There are the targeted apps, which are, what apps do you want this to apply to? Do you want it to apply to Word and PowerPoint? Do you want to apply it to apply to everything? And then finally, uh, the policy settings, which are the actual controls that you have in the policy that get applied to the applications. From the user point of view, this is what part of what makes mobile application management so popular is it's really easy. All I have to do is be notified that, um, hey, this is now available for the Word application, the Office applications are available for corporate use. You have the user go to the store and download the apps. And the first time they launch the app, they're prompted to log in with their corporate credentials, and they're done. So let's take a look at what the policies and the, and the actually look like here. Just out of curiosity, as, as an aside, has anybody played with the, the uh, password with, passwordless logon into Azure? Anybody? No? So this is something that's really quite, quite interesting to note, and it's not specifically on this topic, but you should know about it, is that uh, Microsoft, uh, the, the Azure Active Directory team, is really strongly pursuing, they're trying to remove the dependency on passwords. We all, if we're in here, I'm not gonna belabor how much we all love passwords here. Um, and what they're doing is with a combination of changes to the uh, Azure AD login flow and uh, the Authenticator app, uh, removing the need to use passwords. So actually, I'm gonna just do this real quick so you can see this. Um, I'm gonna log in. This is with my personal account. And it's prompting me for sign in. It's saying, we'll send a sign in request. Let's see if I can really zoom in in that. We'll send a sign in request to your phone. Send notification. So I'm getting a push notification, new sign-in request for your Microsoft account, approve or deny. The flow is just a little bit weird here because now I'm getting prompted for Touch ID. So this is, okay, prove that this is really you on here, which it does. And now what happens? I'm in. Actually, that signed me out. Wait, now here we come. Wow, that's right, so the demo gods just, uh, just died on me. Let's try that one more time. I'll have to beat up Alex. Send notification. Approve sign in. Approve. Fingers crossed. Oh, touch ID. It asked me for a touch ID a second time, which is part of this flow I still don't understand. Is that MDF policy? I'm sorry? Is that policy from your MDF? No. That's general login. That's something you can set up on your MSID. I'm sorry, this particular one uh, is an Azure AD login. There is uh, a variant on it with your MSID where it will, all, it will do a further a level of authentication 
where it will push uh, a set of numbers, and you have to go and choose which is the correct number to log in. So anyway, I just thought that you would, would find that interesting. And, and understanding the strategic direction is that they are really working hard at, at getting rid of that. I'm logging into the global administrator of one of my test, test tenants, uh, tenants. Yep. So when I'm working in my home office and I leave my phone downstairs, it's like, don't. So let's take a look at uh, Intune app protection, which is this right here. This is a mobile application management. And as you can see here, is, uh, up here is app policy. App configuration is more towards um, uh, line of business uh, wrapped or SDK apps. Uh, and then, you know, different types of reporting and all of that. But the app policy is really kind of what we care about. So I've got two policies here, and we're just going to look at the corporate Android protection policy. It's a general policy. And here are those uh, different uh, uh, policy configuration areas I told you about. And so let's take a look and see who it's assigned to. I have it assigned to all users, and for some reason, I apparently also have it assigned to Intune license users. So it's kind of duplicate, but. What are the apps that are targeted to, to have this applied to? I have a smattering of apps on here, PowerPoint, OneDrive, I skip OneNote. This is simply it. You just simply choose the ones that you want out of a pick list. Very easy. The policy settings are the interesting part. So the first policies that are, I think are, are interesting are right here. So this is, do you choose to allow app to transfer data to other apps? or from other apps. So if for all of the apps that are in this policy, this, is your, this shows what you can do with data between them and data with other applications. So the choices that you have are policy managed apps, all apps, or no apps. So if you choose no apps, you can't share data among, uh, across any apps at all. Each app is locked individually um, highly secured down. All apps means there's no policy. It means that even though you've applied a MAM policy um, to, the, to that device, they can still move data wherever they want. And then policy managed apps, which is obviously what is most commonly chosen, uh, says that you can transfer data between the apps that are controlled by policy, but not out of that container. Sean? Yes. So the question from Gil, is it possible to associate a single device with more than one tenant? Not that I'm aware of. Um, it's because, well, and remember again, that because this is, app, this is application level, um, it's, it's, you're not specifically associating the device. So this will show up in one tenant like that. Um, it's a question of you have to log out and log in. You can't be logged into the app with multiple accounts in this for this policy to work. Yeah, 
You could do that, yes. The application, the application policies would apply as when you logged in to that tenant. Um, the other, the other thing to note here is prevent save as. So this prevents renaming, and it also prevents saving the document to some of these, um, you know, uh, non. Uh, non-policy, external policy uh, data locations. So your choice is here. Uh, select which storage services that the corporate data can be saved to. And I chose OneDrive for business and SharePoint, but not local storage. So corporate, but not personal. So uh, when you're talking about application, it's Azure-based applications. Yep. The, the mobile applications that you uh, installed on the, on the device, yes. So since you signed me now, so the, quest, uh, the question is, and I'm belatedly repeating it is, can you, if, if I have, say this correctly, once you have used the application for corporate use, you can't use it for personal use, is that the question? Right. The answer is yes, you can use it for personal use. So that's the beauty of this in a bring your own device scenario. You, even though you have worked with corporate data and saved it to OneDrive for business, if you have something on Dropbox or you have just something stored locally on your, on your device, you can open it, you can do whatever you want, want with it. Now, if you take that off of your local storage and you edit it and you save it to OneDrive for business, you can't go back. There's a Roach Motel analogy in there somewhere, but I won't, I won't pursue it. Um, let's see what else is interesting in this policy. Uh, cut, copy, and paste works uh, very similarly. So restrict cut, copy, and paste with other apps, policy-managed apps. So you can, that shows us where you can go. So you can't paste it into a local, uh, you know, non-corporate app. Encrypt application data. This is a, especially for uh, Android, this is interesting. So <clears throat> make sure that the application data as it moves out of the device is always encrypted. And you can choose to decrypt it or disable it if the device itself has encryption. So on an, on, on an iPhone, by default, <clears throat> it's, the device is encrypted. Uh, the data on it's encrypted. But you can choose regardless to keep it encrypted on top of the base device encryption. Um, you can choose to disable printing, which is an interesting little capability. <clears throat> and you can also choose to require PIN for access down here. So this is where you would get the PIN prompt when you try to save it to corporate, uh, corporate data stores. If there's anything else. Oh, there's more stuff. This is all about, you know, what the how many, how many attempts before a pin is reset, the number, how simple the pin is, what the length should be, uh, whether or not you allow finger, fingerprints to do the authentication for you, um, blocking screen capture, you know, some useful capability. So this gives you an idea of what these, uh, what these policies look like. And this is normally where I would have pulled up the iPad and shown you on the screen there, but unfortunately it's not working on this network. I have just one slide on Windows information protection, the, the client uh, aspect, I think of a sort of the, the client relative to Azure information protection, which is maybe why that's why they called it that. Yes, question. Are there stand, the question is, are there standards that you can that you can use to develop applications that will be integrated with MAM. Is that what your question is? Um, I'm. I will tell you up front that I'm. I'm not. A, I can't develop my way out of the paper bag. But but I will. But the uh, the Intune uh, SDK 
is designed specifically so that you can write applications and have them integrated with MDM and with MAM to get full capability out of it. So I would say look in the Intune SDK documentation. Any other questions? Those of you on the, from the West Coast, you're not too hungry yet. Those of you from the East Coast are thinking, oh, how long before supper? How long before dinner? Um, Windows Information Protection does data policy enforcement down in the Windows 10 operating system, Windows 10 1607 plus. Uh, it has uh, the ability to have a, a white list of allowed applications. So for example, you, know, you can choose to disallow having a Dropbox client running on, on, your, on your corporate PCs. Uh, in a manner to what I just showed you in mobile, it has the ability to, con to configure managed apps, like to prevent cut and pasting outside of managed applications. And it will encrypt data at rest, and as well as encrypt data at, when it's on uh, removable media. It does require um, uh, an Intune MDM or SCCM uh, subscription to, to be able to enable this. It's not, it's not containerized in, ex, in, in exactly the same way, but I'd, I'd have to look more into it. It's relatively new. So now I'm gonna dive a little bit more into Azure Information Protection itself. How many of you have played with Azure Information Protection? Three or four, four or five people, something like that, okay. I was working with a large healthcare provider on the West Coast earlier this year, and are any of you in healthcare? Work in healthcare? So healthcare, one, one guy, there's, healthcare has got a lot of restrictions to it. It's a, it's a heavily re regulated I industry, and one of the, you know, the big dogs in regulation there is HIPAA, which has a lot of regulations around how you handle, thank goodness, how you handle uh, electronic medical records, uh, our, our medical history. And if you violate a HIPAA regulation, the uh, Office for Civil Rights can put a penalty on you that is so big it severely impacts your business operations. It's not just a slap on the hand. Companies live in fear of HIPAA violations. Problem is, there are violations all over the place. And in this particular uh, instance, we had an administrator, and she was responsible for what's called um, reasonable What's it called again? I always have the hardest time remembering what it's called. Meaningful use, because it is, it, it is a term that is not meaningful to me, ironically. Um, so she was responsible for meaningful use. And what she would do is she would extract data records out of the EPIC uh, electronic medical records system, structured data, and she'd pull it into an Excel spreadsheet. And this is meaning, unstructured data. And this meaningful use data contained information about 110 plus clinics that this company ran in the metro area. And this was data destined for the clinic uh, managers to talk to their doctors about when they had violations of meaningful use. So the clinic managers had to talk to their doctors. The problem is the meaningful use data it contained PII, personally identifiable information, that was restricted under HIPAA. So she couldn't just take that Excel spreadsheet and mail it to the clinic managers who would mail it to the doctors or show it to the doctors because that's a HIPAA violation. They've lost control of it. So what she had to do was when a particular clinic had a doctor that had a meaningful use violation, she had to bring up the spreadsheet. Well, she had to schedule a Skype meeting with the clinic manager. She had to, and in the meeting, she had to bring up the spreadsheet and share her screen to show the violations uh, so that the, the clinic manager could write it down, or he certainly never took a screenshot of it, and then who is then go show it to a doctor. So it was a huge time-consuming problem, and it still, uh, it still didn't protect the data uh, in a certain way because it was, there's no way of telling how it got screenshotted or anything like that. So that is an example of a, of a classic problem that AIP is designed to solve. And I'm not gonna show you how, it, I'm not gonna tell you how it's solved yet. I'm gonna force you to listen for a few more minutes. That's a pretty graphic, so I'm gonna make it stay up there a little longer. 
<clears throat> so, okay, so what if the data protected itself instead of using the containers to protect it? When that happens, the container security has become reduced from critical to just important. It becomes another layer in a multi-layer defense strategy, kind of like what Darren was talking about earlier, having a multi-layer strategy. When the data protects itself, the data is safe inside the container, outside the container. It doesn't matter where it is. And that's, if you, that's really, as a security person, that's really a freeing feeling. A corollary of that, though, is that identity becomes more critical in this situation. And, um, you know, Alex Simons has, has, who's the Director of Program Management for Azure Active Directory, has tattooed across his forehead, identity is the new perimeter, or identity is the control plane, that's it. Um, and other conferences will talk about identity as the new perim perimeter. In this case, it really is true, because when you're protecting the data, and the data is protecting itself, the only way to get to the data is with identity. And if you're weak in identity, then you're weak in your data protection. Microsoft has a long association with working with data protection. In 2003, they first came out in Windows Server 2003, they came out with RMS featuring, and, and don't beat me up if I don't get these exactly right, it's kind of hard to find in the midst of time. But you know, basic RMS had encryption and it had policy, and it was standalone, uh, it didn't work with any other identity stores. So in 2008, they incorporated RMS into Active Directory and called it ADRMS. So you can use Active Directory principles, security principles, to uh, control access to documents. Fast forward, what is that, six years to 2014 uh, to Azure RMS. So taking the capabilities that were in Active Directory RMS and making it available as a service. We should note that even though RMS had been around for quite a while, it had seen very limited adoption. For anyone, has, did anyone ever deploy AD RMS? Mickey raises his hand, Gil, of course. What a pain in the butt. <laughs> uh, a pain in the butt to do and had very, very uh, low user uptake because it was still difficult from the user, the user point of view. Azure RMS made it easier because you didn't have to do a lot of the heavy lifting. The, the RMS service was now in the cloud. You didn't have to stand up your own servers. Um, if you chose to, you, didn't have to have, you don't have to have your own certificate authority. So that, that took a huge amount of work away from it. They also added tracking and revocation, which I'll dive into in a little bit, uh, which gives you the ability to um, know where a document has gone and pull the access of the document back. The tide really turned in 2015 when Microsoft bought Secure Islands. Secure Islands was a startup and what they, their product really focused on is a client front end that made document classification and labeling intuitive, uh, very easy to work with. And that really is the key to make RMS, to make uh, Azure Information Protection successful. So they took all that and rebranded it as AIP and put all of those capabilities into it. So we have auto labeling, classification, protection, tracking and revoc revocation, and a couple of four letter acronyms, bring your own key and hold your own key associated around uh, what you want to do with your um, PKI environment. If you want to, if you already had AD RMS, if you're one of the 10 people that deployed AD RMS and they were still using it, you can move your key up into Azure so people could still do access documents. Although most of the companies that I've seen are just willing to let uh, Azure handle their, their key. I kind of, I just gave an overview of it, but just to, to, to make sure that we understand what AIP does, it helps an organization classify, label, and protect the documents, documents and emails. You understand what's important, what needs to be protected, instead of you don't want to just go off and protect everything. And protection, protection is, this is the crux of what I've been talking about, obviously, is that it protects data at the data level regardless of where it goes. Classic use cases for this are uh, internal processes. If you have HR documents or legal documents that you want to make sure 
don't escape uh, anywhere and are restricted to a small group of users that are allowed to view them. And the other is external collaboration, where you can, uh, you know, I think of like the legal department. Uh, the legal department is constructing some kind of a document and they want to send it to an external expert for review, but they only want that expert to be able to see it and nobody else to see it. This is another a perfect use case for information protection. The components of information protection are a labeling and classification engine, the actual protection engine of Azure RMS, the tracking and revocation capabilities, the AIP client, which is quite important, and a brand new capability, the AIP scanner, which is now in public preview. So for labeling and classification, the basic premise is this. You can't protect corporate data until you know what to protect. You have to go through corporate data or, I mean, we really have two bodies. We have the existing body of data and we have the new body of data that is being created going forward. Obviously, the easier of the two problems to solve is the new data going forward. And I'll talk about that mass of data that we have that's already out there. So to classify it, you put a label on it. And then once you have a label on it, you can put specific protections on the data. This is really the big deal, labeling and classification. And it's powered by the AIP client. So the AIP client is a freely downloadable from Microsoft. If you, you know, just look for Azure Information Protection Client Download, you'll get the latest version. And you know, with all what's been done on it, and usually they'll even show, they'll have a beta version there because they're, they're encouraged feedback with the newest capabilities. But it does a lot. So the first thing is kind of what I was giving you that client-side uh, value add, which is the AIP toolbar. There is a file explorer extension called Share and Protect, where you can right-click on a file, and then you can say Share and Protect, and you can say who you want it to go to and what kind of permissions you want it to have. This would be for that external legal um, scenario where you want to send it to an external legal counsel, right click, put their email address in there, and uh, send it to them. They have to then go back and authenticate, and that will give them access to it. And I'll actually step through the authentication process. A protected files viewer is if you want to open a protected file that is not part of the classic Office Suite doc or Excel or whatever. Um, it allows you to look at um, whatever it is that you've chosen to, whatever protected information comes in. There's a PowerShell module in it that's not really well known, but what it allows you to do is both do client-side uh, AIP PowerShell commands, but this is also tied into the AIP scanner, the command list for the AIP scanner. Again, this is new. Uh, this was just announced at um, Ignite and shortly afterwards. And then finally, the core of the RMS client that does the encryption itself is in this client. It's for you know, all of these platforms, Windows 7 through 10, Mac, Android 4.4, iOS 8 plus, and if any of you are out there using it, Windows 8.1 RT. I still ha I have a Windows, what is it? I have a Windows 3, yeah, I have, this is a Windows Pro 3, and I have a Windows 3 device, which is actually, you know, has its uses. So this is, a, this is a screenshot of the AIP toolbar. And I describe this as AIP's secret weapon. And, it, you know, and at the security airlift at Microsoft in the spring, they showed a, an uptake in the, the use of AIP. Uh, and it was flat, you know, RMS, flat, 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 flat. And when this toolbar came along, it went, adoption went like this. Because the key of this is this is file classification at the creation time of the document by the person that best knows how to classify that document. There's no one better. And so it just becomes a regular part of their workflow, and I'll show what this looks like in a second. There are basically three kinds of classification um, methods. The first is manual, where you'll see this toolbar and you'll say, okay, I think I should label this, uh, I think I should label this general. The second is recommended, where AIP will pop up a pop-up that says, 
based on this information in this document, it looks like you, this should be labeled X. Yes? And the person just goes, yes. Or they just click on the label and off they go. It gives them the option to give it some other label if they want. And the last is automatic classification, which works when you're further down the road in deploying AIP and you're very certain of yourself. It's generally recommended that you limit automatic classification where there's no user input in, in, in how it's done until you have a really good sense and you have your policies really finely tuned. An important uh, capability in this labeling process are sublabels and scoped labels. So sublabels allow you to narrow your categories down a little bit. Microsoft strongly recommends that you don't jack with the, the top level labels that they've chosen. They've gone through, they've gone th through, went through over a year of validation with a ton of customers in, in good AIP deployments to say that those labels should stay the way they are. Typically what happens is, you know, an IT guy goes, oh, I can do a better job than this, this is just generic, and they change it all around and it makes things worse. It's very important to, and I'll go over this in best practices, so I'm not gonna dive into that now. But an example of a sub-label is there's a high level uh, label that's called confidential. So you could add a sub-label on there, in there called HR confidential. So the HR confidential information is different than other kinds of confidential information. And then perhaps even within that, personnel data. Maybe the HR people want to characterize personnel data different from salary data. Now the problem with that is when you do that, you could quickly, almost immediately, overwhelm your users with labels and sub-labels and trees and all that. And the real learning, and if there's any if there's any takeaway from me blathering at you all this time, is to kiss it. Keep it simple, stupid. Don't take the IT approach or what I've said for years around Active Directory. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. So don't go nuts on this stuff. Um, but what scope labeling allows you to do is to take these sub-labels and only have them apply to the groups that it's important to. So only the HR users will see the um, personnel data, because what you would do is there is a, you know, there's an Active Directory or Azure Active Directory group called HR Generalists, and then you scope the label to only apply to HR Generalists. So when their toolbar comes up and their labels come up, that's all they'll see are the, the, the labels that are scoped to them. It really is the key to create a manageable labeling and protection hierarchy. We implemented Azure Information Protection for a, uh, a large manufacturing company in um, Delaware, split off from another large manufacturing company. And they had a lot of, um, they had industrial processes that they wanted to protect. And so they ended up with a fair number of scoped policies uh, of sub-labels, but they were all very carefully scoped to just the groups that cared about them. So everybody's toolbar looked Simple. The next component is Azure RMS. Like I said, that's the protection technology. It encrypts the document data. And the other thing that it does is it includes a policy that defines who is authorized to use it and what way they're authorized to use it. So I want to dive in a little bit to see what this is like and what, what it creates. So when you uh, the user want to protect a document, what happens? The first thing that happens is the user authenticates to Azure AD. The second thing that happens is the RMS client, and most of what happens on this takes place at the RMS client. The RMS client creates a random content key. This is the key that will encrypt the document itself. And he encrypts the document with the content key. The second thing that, or the next thing that happens is that the client creates a policy. And the policy is what you have said, um, this guy that is external can have view only or view and reply rights. Of course, that, that policy has to be protected as well. So the client encrypts the policy and the content key with the organizational key, the tenant key, 
uh, and then signs it with the user certificate to show, yes, yay, barely, this has come from who you expect it's come from. Then those two things are embedded in an encrypted document. I'm sorry, I'm sorry the, the encrypted document and the policy, the encrypted policy are put in a file, and that's the protected document. It's got two components. It's got an encrypted document, and it's got an encrypted policy as well. So if you want to read that file, you kind of have to, you know, roll that in the other direction. So the first thing that happens is your client authenticates with Azure Active Directory and the RMS service. The client sends the document policy and the user asserts to, uh, to Azure RMS. So the first thing that happens is let's find out what the policy is. Azure RMS decrypts the policy because remember it was encrypted with the organization key and builds the user rights. Then it extracts the content key and it encrypts the content key because it's got to send it back over the net with the user's public key. So only that user can open it. The content key is embedded with an encrypted use license and sent back to the client. Then the client decrypts it and then the, now that the client has the content key, the, content can, the client can decrypt the, the, the document. A lot, a lot going on, but it works very well. The permissions that you can do for RMS, um, I like to think of these as access control lists only for data and not, not quite as fine grained. So the sort of things that you can do are view content, edit and save, print, copy and extract, and for mail-related uh, documents, uh, reply, reply all, and forward. And there's also, there's full control. There's also, to make this a little bit easier, roles. Uh, so the roles are, have predefined settings for permissions, so you don't have to go and manually do it each time. If you create a document, you are the creator and you, have, uh, and you retain full control over the document. But you can also be a co-owner, which gives you almost all the same rights, a co-author, a reviewer, or a viewer. The, and the viewer obviously has the, the smallest number of rights to just view the document. You can also look at it, uh, you can also look at it cust from custom. So let's take a look at the labeling. Yeah, Darren. If I had a candy, I'd toss it to you. So the answer is yes. The, Darren's question is, is can, can you include Azure Information Protection in, uh, included in conditional access? And uh, as of Ignite, that is now in public preview. Okay. So conditional access, and I think I have a slide here, but I'll just talk about it now, is to my mind the secret sauce behind what makes uh, the Azure AD and EMS and Office 365 story so compelling is you have this collection of conditions that you can say uh, and they're based on where your location is, are you on or off the corporate network, what app are you accessing the resource with. Um, really, really important one, uh, well, is your device managed? So we're talking about, you know, is it MDM or MAM managed? Really important one is risk. Is what is the sign in? What is the user sign in risk uh, of this session? Um, and and if it if I determine it to be this is tied into uh, Azure Identity Protection, which uh, the young Mr. Savile back there I believe is going to be talking about. Um, if your sign in risk is determined to be high, then apply another set of controls. So what Darren's question is are related to is that Microsoft has just incorporated as yet another condition the labeling, Azure Information Protection labeling. So now you can have the scenario that if I have a document that's labeled HR personnel data and I'm inside the corporate network, allow me access right in. If I'm trying to access that same document that with that same protection that is, doesn't matter if it's on an HR person's or it doesn't matter where it is out there, if it's outside the corporate network, require multi-factor authentication before you can get access to it or block access to it entirely. 
So if, you're not, if you don't, haven't spent any time with conditional access, conditional access is super powerful, what you can do for your, for your companies in a hybrid environment. So this is the Azure Information Protection uh, blade in, um, in the Azure portal. And I think this is, they, the AIP team really bends over backwards to get, make, get you started and help you out. I mean, in the, in the blade, they have a video on how to get started, which is pretty fun. But uh, what I want to show you here is the policies. So this is what's called the global policy. So these, are, these, are, these global policies are applied to all of the users. There's not, it's, it's, like the, uh, it's like the default password policy in an Active Directory domain. Everybody gets it. Um, and these are the ones that, you know, Microsoft had spent so much time making sure that they're, you know, the way they like them. Uh, personal data, public data, general, confidential, and there are a couple layers of confidential. Credit card data, which is a special one that's put in for this, for, for, that I put in for this, social security numbers, and highly confidential. And if we look to the right, you'll see that there are a couple of, it's both a global policy, and that a couple of them, the credit card data uh, one, is, has both marking and protection on it. So in other words, once we've labeled it, we're gonna do something to that policy. We're gonna both mark it, and then we're gonna add protection to it. So I'm gonna go into the credit card data policy and take a little, and look at it, and what it can do in a little more detail. So first, enabled on or off is just determines whether or not it will show on the toolbar. So if you're developing something and you're not quite ready and you're not, you know, and you're still, and you're still playing with it, uh, if you have it turned off, nobody will see it. Uh, the label name and description, et cetera, et cetera. Let's see if I can move down on this. I guess I'm going to have to do this. So this, set permissions for documents and emails containing this label. You can choose to not configure it, protect it, or remove protection. So when you first start playing with um, Azure Information Protection, and this includes deployment, and I'll have this in best practices again, what you want is to just start labeling. Don't mess with protection yet. Just start labeling. And so if you just, and if you do that and it just creates labels, then uh, then that's great. Pro this in particular is being protected, which means it's tied into Azure RMS to do some, put, apply some protections to this document. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on protection and look at what the protection is showing. So it's showing that it's uh, that the protection that the key is in Azure. It's not hold your own key, uh, which is if you have if, which you came from AD RMS. And then you can choose to set permissions as what you want to do in it. And these particular permissions are trivial. It just, it's just one of, uh, the, this is the tenant name, and it's set to co-owner. So there's nothing, nothing special on there. There's, note that there's no content expiration. Uh, there is information down there about offline access. So one of the things that, if you think about the way uh, you know, a, a question, a logical question that people come up with when we talk about how uh, RMS works is you have to go to, uh, you have to authenticate to Azure AD before you can look at the document. Well, what if I'm traveling and I need to look at this document? If you've opened it once, there is a grace period by which you can continue to open it without having to authenticate. But you can control that all the way down to user must authenticate every time against Azure Active Directory. And this is where you can do that. This is also where you can do marking. So a visual marking, such as a header or a footer. 
So this, this particular policy says it doesn't have a header or a footer, but it does have a watermark on it, and the watermark will say confidential credit card data. So what I'm going to do is let's go take a look at what this actually looks like in practice. So this is a Windows 10 client, and it is, has the AIP client installed. So I'm going to launch Word. And actually, what I'm going to do is let's go from here. So here's a, here's a document that's called Q3 Product Strategy. And here's the toolbar across the top. And if I had the ability to zoom in, I don't think I have the ability to zoom in uh, in a virtual machine. So you're just going to have to take my word for it if you can't see it very well. So you can see right now it says um, the sensitivity is not set because it's a brand new open document. But what we can do is I'm going to mark it confidential all employees. And when I've done that, it automatically marked it as confidential and put, a, and put a watermark on it. Now, I'm going to create one more document. Actually, let me just do it this way. And in this document, I'm going to put in um, credit card data by a credit by a, it's called an information type, and this is a this is a um, it's an engine that searches for content data and automatically classifies it. So I'm going to say credit card number, and I'm going to give it what is recognized as a credit card number. At least this is so. Hopefully that's 15 ones. We'll find out in a second. Uh, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to save it. I'll just save to documents. And I think it's hilarious if you, can, you can't see this, but it's actually trying to save credit card number with the credit card in the title, which is probably not very secure. But what it did is the toolbar popped up and said, it is recommended to label this file as credit card data because it recognized this in the template. And change now. And so now it put protections on the document and it labeled it as credit card data. So that's how the AIP toolbar works at the time of creation. Tracking and revocation. Uh, I'm going to skip over tracking and revocation to just simply let me suffice it to say that um, it allows you to track who has attempted to open it, whether they are successful, whether they have failed, where they are geographically, although VPN can mess that up sometimes. And you can then mark a document. You can see if a document looks like someone has tried to open it and you don't know who they are or they unsuccessfully did it, you can revoke it. So where that works out very well is if you put it like an R an RFP uh, or, or, rest, or an RFQ, either one. That sort of thing works very well for tracking and revocation. So what did we do for meaningful use for this company? We had the administrator with that Excel document right click on it, put the email address of the, of the clinic manager that needed to see it, had them protect it and sent it. And they had it set for view only so they could view it they couldn't print it, they couldn't save it, and then they could just simply have the doctor walk into their office and go over meaningful use, and they know that the data is protected without violating HIPAA. These are the document formats that you can protect, all the native office formats, text documents, the vast majority of stuff that we work with. That's what's called native protection, which gives you encryption and rights management. Generic protection is for everything else. You can pretty much wrap anything. And in generic protection, what you get is the document will be encapsulated by a 
a container, uh, not encrypted, but then you must authenticate yourself to be able to open the document. So it has basic capabilities and audit logging, but not the, not the richer capability set of the natives. This is a comparison to, in my musings about this stuff, there are parallels between access control and information protection in that access control has got ACLs and information protection has got labels and RMS. Access control is more granular. Uh, information protection has got medium grain. Access control is only effective in a container and uh, information protection is effective anywhere. Lots of third-party solutions support Azure RMS. RMS. The AIP scanner is one thing that I want to make sure that we talk about. So we have, I'm talking about all this new information. And the AIP scanner handles everything, is designed to scan and handle everything that is on-premises. All of your stuff that's still out there. So what you would do is you install the RMS client on a Windows server and use those uh, PowerShell commandlets to run the AIP scanner on the Windows server. It'll also scan network shares like filers and SharePoint 2013 and 2016 sites. The first scan is just discovery mode and you can decide what to do for there. If you wanna make changes, you can run the scanner and it will walk through your file server and label, uh, ideally just label for starters. And that's when you get the doc, when you get this presentation, that's information on how to get to it. Um, there are enhancements to Office Message encryp Encryption, which has been around for a little while, but it makes it easier to work with. The idea being that you can encrypt messages and send them to people on Gmail or uh, Outlook.com or Yahoo or even AOL and be able to encrypt the message back and forth. Uh, the roadmap, I want to point out just a couple of things that are interesting. They've done a lot of work for GDPR, so they have information types that will automatically detect GDPR data types. I've talked about the AIP scanner. We've talked a little bit about conditional access and how important that is. Um, native labeling, uh, so there's integration, and I'll talk a little bit about it tomorrow. There's native labeling and cloud app security will now uh, understand AIP labels and apply protections. And uh, first half of 2018, uh, starting to have native labeling in Mac, iOS, Android, and web apps because it's not native right now. And, and you can do DLP triggers on it. I did want to really quickly get to these best practices before the hook comes out. Um, when you're considering, your, so this looks interesting to you and you want to try it out. This is what you need to be thinking about. You need to identify your proof of concept groups. Go for the easy wins, and that means small to medium groups in size and the groups that are willing to engage in this process. Um, and have a real problem, like I said, by reasonable use example. Great targets are HR and legal, uh, or people that are trying to do external sharing and they're worried about data leakage. Sit down with them and learn one or two, maybe three scenarios from them, what, what's, where their pain points are and design AIP to solve the user, the, to solve the use case. Then pilot the configuration within the group. So you're gonna wanna teach the users how to use the toolbar, because the user is the weakest point. Then, once you've taught them how to use it, deploy the client. Teach them first before you do deploy it so they don't get the classic IT. What did IT put on my client? Test the scenarios. Did you configure AIP correctly? Does it work like they want it to? Adjust it, iterate. Then once that pilot has been done, open up, the, open up the configuration to the rest of the group. And the way you do it, and the way you can control this, and you can do it by group, but you can also do it by who has the AIP client. If you haven't, they haven't deployed the AIP client, they won't, they won't get any of this. Then, and this is more process and, and politics, document the win and show how it really helped that user group and then use that to get impetus for the next group and move on to the next proof of concept. Nobody implements AIP as a broad, corporate-wide, I'm going to protect everything. It's used to protect a very, very small percentage of documents that are really important. I've already said, don't overthink it. Use the five labels in the global policy. 
The labels must be clear to the user, not to IT. We're all in IT and we've got a jaundiced view of how this stuff. Don't say HIPAA. Don't say PCI. Use, a, use something that they will understand. Use sub-labels, we've, we've talked about. And it's great to start with labeling, with labeling only and without applying any protection at all. You can have good success just with that. Recommended and define rights by groups. Use Active Directory, Azure Active Directory groups. Um, for protection, it's very powerful and you can shoot yourself in the foot. Um, so that means, again, just because you can doesn't mean you should. I think one of the key ones on here is to use, allow full control. Don't, don't lock down things just yet. That will still accomplish 99% of your data leakage is by not messing with lots of the, with lots of the permissions. I've already mentioned that it's so, it's so important to have strong identity to make this work. And uh, again, both, both provisioning processes, management processes, and, identif and identity protection processes. This is a Microsoft slide, and I wanted to just put in here so you can see where it fits across everything. So I briefly touched on Windows information protection. Uh, we have the office-specific protections like data loss protection and advanced data governance. And here is Azure information protection working its way all the way up to both Office 365 uh, and uh, cloud services and on-premises, thanks to the AIP scanner. So remember that your primary goal is to protect the data, not the container. And the closer you can get the security boundary to the data, the better. And this makes sense, you know, uh, even though it's part of defense in depth, the brick wall versus you know where that data is going to go and it will, or the data will be protected wherever it goes. Start trying information protection for high security business units. You know, you can get a trial for this AIP trial and, and try it yourself or um, to use it to get your feet wet because it's quite easy to work with. And for the 11th time, you must have a solid identity infrastructure to make this all work, otherwise it's kind of pointless. And that's it. I'm right about, Debbie hasn't pulled out the hook yet. Um, I love this slide. Couldn't get my head around cloud computing. So the fact that we're here, I think, uh, means that we've managed to stay out of that category for a few months at least. Thanks. Any questions? Gil. Um, I have two questions. Actually, what is, can you multiple labels to a single document? If so, how does it resolve the policy? Um, no. It's, a, it's one label, which is where the sub-labeling comes in handy because it has a specific label, but if you have a label hierarchy or a taxonomy, you know, you, have, you can see a hierarchy associated with it. What's your second question? second question, what are the sort of lost key and change of ownership scenarios? Like, uh, you know, a whole package of documents, and then Well, do you mean, so for example, if you have uh, AD RMS, if you've had it like on-premises, or you're talking about a, either one. Well, I mean, the key obviously is the key. <laughs> I remember that. Um, so in the case of that's what, that's what hold your own key or bring your own key is designed to do to retain access to it if you lose access. Now, the other scenario that you're talking about is if you have are you talking about a, a different tenants or they're moving between different tenants or yeah, giving keep? Yeah. So as an example, if you're changing ownership of, of group of documents from one tenant to another. That's a great question. I'll have to think about that. Um, I'm not sure. That's, 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 that's like worth whiteboarding to, to figure out what would happen. Is anybody else in here? Because um, really it is, you have to, you have to, um, the, the encryption of the document is keyed to that, that exact key. The only thing I can think of is you'd have to decrypt the documents and re-encrypt them with the new key, which is obviously could be challenging. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Any other questions or are you hungry for lunch? I'm hungry for lunch, so if you want to talk later under over a drink, that's, that's, a, that's a great way to do it too. Thanks for putting up with me.